Father, I, I know there's a lot of things that, that we could do. Uh, you've gifted us with amazing talents and, and, and abilities. Um, but there's certain things that we just cannot do. We must call upon the name of Jesus uh, to help us in certain things. And, and there just seems to be a dark vibe in here, a dark spirit here tonight. It's not the same joyous, happy family that usually gathers here over these last three years. It just doesn't seem that way. Uh, Lord, I hope I'm going to do wrong. Uh, but I may not be. I, I'm not the only one feeling it. So, um, Lord, we've come here tonight to worship you. We've come here tonight to proclaim your word. We've come here tonight to, so that you can build our faith. We've come here tonight so that you can build your church. Lord, we've come here tonight to love on each other and encourage each other to, to, to good deeds. Uh, Lord, we're just here for you, Lord. And, and it just seems like there's something else here. And so, Lord, um, we just want to ask you right now that you would come to our defense, that you would be our sword, our shield, that you would just protect this family. This is your church. This is your people. And we are calling upon you, Dad, to, to protect us. And um, so um, just, just, just do that. I don't know how to articulate it, Lord, other than just from my heart, I, I just asking you to come and, and, and be here with us. And, um, your word says that you're an ever-present help in time of trouble. And it seems like there's a little bit of trouble. So we know that you're here, Lord. We ask that you fight for us. That you, by the, by the power of the name of Jesus Christ, that you would kick out any negative or any dark spirit that may be here trying to uh, influence this place tonight, trying to interfere with what you're trying to do. Just kick them out. Kick them out. And let us have this time of, of rejoicing. Uh, Lord, I, I ask for your blessing on our time together as a family. And um, we just want to love each other. And we want to love on you. And we definitely, definitely want to feel your love here tonight. So please come and do that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a red balloon. It's true. We all know our colors. This balloon is red. So, oh, that's green balloon. Oh, it's definitely a green balloon. That is the prettiest yellow balloon. <laughs> this is red. Come over here. It's red! Yeah, it's red. red. You should come see from my perspective. It's green. Nice blue balloon. It's green! This is red. Why are you saying it's red? It's blue. It's totally purple from here. Okay, hold on. Let, let's sell this one some bro, okay? Princess Candy.
just do me a favor, and you'll, you'll know why here in a little bit. Just pull your license out, pull your ID for me, please, everybody. You're all being checked for warrants. <laughs> Just kind of hold that with you with your Bible. Uh, I want to invite you also to grab one of these Bibles on your seats. If you don't have a Bible with you that you can call your own, or you, you might use one of your devices, that's cool. Uh, but if you don't, you can grab one of these Bibles, and uh, frequently you'll see the page number and the Bible reference up on the screen that we'll be going to. So. Um, just grab one of those Bibles, and if, it's, if you don't have one, just take it home with you, it's our gift. Um, so I just want to kind of go back a little bit, I don't know, I guess about a month or so ago we changed the name of the church, and um, we changed it for a lot of different reasons, and I know a lot of people have asked why, um, but here's the, here's the big thing, uh, the reason why we changed it, the big reason, one of many, but the big reason is because I think that we as a people, we're just, we're sick and tired of, of this guy. I mean, I don't know if I'm the only one feeling it. You know, you just, something's just not right. And the world's just jacked up. And it doesn't make any difference what we do. We can't throw money at the problem. We can't throw sex at the problem. We can't throw career at the problem. We can't throw sports at the problem. You just can't throw stuff at the problem. It just doesn't go away. And, and so we realized um, that there's just this, this this God of this world, the devil, he's just kind of running things around here. And you can tell, even if you're an absolute believer and you love Jesus, you just, you know something's just jacked up. And so the, the name Revolution really reflects an attitude. And, and, I, and I, I hope that in, on an increasing measure that we as a group can become that, that group of people that just says, you know what, I'm not satisfied with the status quo and we need to change everything. It's just not right. And I don't know, I can't speak of other churches, I don't know. I think they all, like, I know churches will preach about this book, but, and, and we do too, but I don't know, even myself, I told my wife today, I don't even know how, how much into it I am. Like, I think I'm totally half-hearted. I'm totally half-hearted. And if you're sitting in that seat and, and you love me and you admire my faith because you, you think that it's something that it's not, I, I'm just telling you, I'm half-hearted. I, I, could, I, I could rise to a higher, much higher. All of us could. And, and that's really the whole idea behind the revolution, and that is to, to totally look at, this, at the landscape of our world and just say it's just not right. Something's not right, we need to, we need to change it. And so we, we just studied like a couple of different things over these last few weeks. Uh, let me just say this. We were supposed to do a top ten. I'm cutting it today. This is the last one. So it's like the top eight, maybe seven. I don't know. But I have a microphone and you don't, so that's what we're doing. But we talked about humility, we talked about valuing human life, we talked about sex and marriage and money. Um, we talked about uh, prayer and repentance, those are gifts that we should be exercising frequently. Uh, we talked about the church body, the community of believers, that Christ died on the cross and brought all of us together according to his good pleasure. But these are just a few of just the thousands and thousands of topics that are found in the Bible, that we should be following, really. And so if anything, I just want to encourage you here, before we get on to tonight's discussion, I just want to, I, I don't want to be church, I just want to be your friend, I want to be your pastor, I love you guys, it's like, I love you guys, I do. I'm just, I'm asking you, like, once and for all, once and for all, could Jesus Christ just be the absolute center of your world? That's the sit up here every day. We come to church every day. And I can talk to you till I'm blue in the face and I have a stroke. It's not going to make a difference until you make the quality choice and make Jesus Christ the center of your life. The everything of your existence. Amen. Like that is the only way that gets done. Amen. The, the only reason why we sit in these seats today is because there were a group of people that did just that. And we, 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 we read it, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4. These people were absolutely sold out. Nothing mattered compared to Jesus. He was it. And, and until we get there, nothing else matters. I, I, I'm wasting my breath if, until you make that choice. Once you make that choice, we build on it. That's your foundation, right? And once we do that, then we can build and build and build and build. 
And anyway, so Jesus talks about a whole lot of things here in the scripture. As a matter of fact, he talks, he taught this whole thing. Isn't he? His spirit inspired them to write this book. And so everything really in this book, really, if you think about it, these are actually, this, these are all quotes. This is all quotes. It's verbatim. This is Jesus talking to you, right? But actually, if you, if, once he comes down to earth in, in the child, he actually speaks out of the mouth of a human being, right? That's kind of cool. And so these writers in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they actually wrote down words that came out of the person, the flesh God. Jesus, the man, right? And so in some Bibles, you'll see it in red. In these church Bibles here, it's not in red, and I do apologize, but he actually speaks some words. And so... I want to share with you tonight uh, a verse, and, and that verse is, is Luke 19, 10, and, and then here's our topic. This is the thing uh, that we want to talk about tonight. We, we talked about humility, and we talked about valuing human life, and we talked about sex, and we talked about love, and we talked about marriage, and we talked about cash, and we talked about prayer, we talked about repentance, and we talked about community, and we could talk and talk and talk and talk about all these different things, but here's what it comes down to. And this is exactly what I was just telling you. Until Jesus Christ is in the center of your life and you realize that this is all that matters and you start living on mission, embracing these things that we teach and that we're learning and make it the object of your day. Like that, when you wake up, that's what you wake it up to do, to go advance the kingdom of God for Christ's sake. That's what it's all about. Okay, all of this stuff and saying, I am going to do this thing, just like those early guys and early gals in the book of Acts, they decided that no matter what, they, they said they realized that none of their stuff was their own. Like everything that they had their whole life was like throwing out the window compared to Jesus Christ. This dude just rose from the dead. And, and so I'm all in on this thing. What am I going to do? going to sell all my stuff? Who cares about my stuff? You're alive. This guy that watched him die on the cross, he's alive, so they're like, we're all in. And so we have to live on mission, not just kind of wandering around hoping for an opportunity. But let me, let me just read this to you, uh, Luke 19, 10. This is the mission statement of Jesus Christ. He says simply this, I came to seek and save the lost. That's it. I came to seek and save the lost. Now, he did a lot of things while I was here. But this was the reason why he did them. He came to seek and save the lost. This is the mission statement of Jesus Christ, the God-man. This is the reason he left heaven to come to earth, was to save and seek. That's what he's doing. That's what he did. He's looking for people, and he's trying to gather them up into this church. Remember, we talked about it last week, that he actually died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, it was to forgive your sin and mine. That's, that's an awesome thing. But one of the other things he did is he broke down the walls of hostility between people groups. They're all in on this thing. He came for every single person on earth, all seven billion of us, to fill the church the body, the bride, all nations, all people, Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, barbaric and well-mannered, young and old, all people. That's why he came. That's the mission statement of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, that's the mission statement of his body, the church. That's why we exist, is to seek and save the lost. That's why Revolution Church is here. That's the reason why we're here. For God so loved what? The world. That means how many people? Every one of them. Whether you like him or not, he came to save the world. He seeks. He seeks. He seeks. He's the hound of heaven. He seeks. He's relentless. He's, he's ferocious when he's trying to catch you. I, listen, I'm speaking out of experience. He met me where I was. This is who Jesus Christ is. When I was on the golf tour, and all of a sudden my, I, I'm, I'm, I'm living, you know, I'm drinking and, and having sex and I'm, and I'm smoking and I'm cussing and I'm making money and, and I don't have to clean my hotel room because the maid will do it. I'm living the life and I'm loving it. 
because it was right here. And when all those things started to fade that the world was offering me, and I just didn't really like him anymore, Jesus shows up in the man of Ralph Howe. Hey, man, why don't you come to one of our Bible studies for FCA? Are you kidding me? Why don't you come to the Bible study at FCA? Hey, no way. Why don't you come to the Bible study for FCA? Well, maybe. Why don't you come to the Bible study for FCA? Okay, but I'm not going to talk. Chip, 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 chip. Whack, whack, whack. Pursuing, pursuing, pursuing. And then I said, yeah, I'll go. And I went. And then it disappeared. And I said, yeah. I'm done. You know what? Because I got off the tour and I got a job in the car business and making more money. More women, more drugs, more drinking, more smoking, more cussing, more money. And all of a sudden, it just starts to fade again. Those things just don't cut it. And guess what? Jesus showed. He didn't just say, well, I tried it before and Moses kind of gave it away. He didn't really want me, so I'm out. See, that's the way we are, right? Come on now, right? That's the way we are. We give someone a shot, they don't come through, ah, time for them. But Jesus doesn't do that. He seeks, he seeks, he seeks. And so when those things that I had started to fade, and the pleasure was just fading away, it didn't really mean much to me anymore. It really, it didn't satisfy. Guess what? He shows up again. The man of red big heart. He's relentless. Because that's what he does. He comes and he meets you where you are. He's not lifeless, motionless. He's not an idol. He's not Mecca, the city. He's not a law that's in print. He's a person. He's God, and he's alive still right now. And that's why he relentlessly pursues people so he can save them from the future that they deserve. John 20, verse 21, says this. Just as the Father sent me, so I send you. Just as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. What does that mean? I love slow Bible reading. This is what you gotta do. When you're slow, you stop and you think. What does that mean? The same way that God the Father sent God the Son, He's sending you the same way. What does that mean? That means that you live to seek and save. He's called you to that. If you're a Christian, that's your mission statement too. To seek and save that which is lost. Being on mission means living with intention, on purpose, not stumbling upon opportunities to maybe advance the kingdom of God, but to hunt them down, to create them, to cultivate them, to be looking for opportunities. When you wake up in the morning, that's what your goal is, somehow, some way. How can I advance the kingdom of God? When Jesus came down, he came what? To seek and save. So when you wake up in the morning, it's to seek and save. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Every single Christian across the earth, that is the job, individually and corporately, is to seek and save that which is lost. The Great Commission tells us we're supposed to go and do that. We all know the Great Commission. I want you to go there with me, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Now, as you're turning there, I want you to do me a favor. Would you pull out your license? You guys all have your license with you? Let me repeat this to you. Jesus Christ said, I came to seek and save the lost. That's the reason he was born. You know what born means, right? Put into a body, brought into the manger, into the stable. The reason he was born, the reason he came here was to seek and save the lost. Do you all agree with me? And just as the Father sent him to seek and save, so I sent you to seek and save. Look at your license. Look where it says D-O-B. It's the day you were born. Now before you get all religious on me and say, oh, I got to be born. I got baptized. Listen, I got it. I got it. But you were born on that day. And the reason why you were born that day was for this reason. Now we've, we failed in that, so we need to be reborn. But the reason you were born, now look at the date of birth again. On that glorious day, the person to the left of that date was born. 
The reason that person in the picture was born was to seek and save the lost. That's the reason you exist. And that's what the church is to do, to seek and save the lost in everything. Please say this with me. In everything that we do is to seek and save the lost. That is what we do. We consider others as more important than ourselves. If we must sacrifice money, energy, food, any resource, anything short of sin, you bring them to the cross. You were born for that reason, is to seek and save the lost. That's why you exist. That's the only reason you live, is to seek and save the lost. Read with me, if you will, Matthew 28. The Great Commission, right? We're going to talk about this mission in life. I have been given all authority on heaven and earth. Now go, make disciples of all people, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them all that I have taught you, and know this, I will be with you to the end of the age. He's with us. You know what he's doing? While he's here, guess what Jesus is doing? Someone tell me. Seeking and saving the lost. And he's with you and he's pulling you and he's asking you to do the same thing. He said, go make disciples. This is a three-step process. What is he saying? Leading to the Lord. That's what we call leading to the Lord. Make a disciple. Have them realize that what they were doing is wrong and his way is best. So you lead them to Christ. You introduce them to this to this new relationship, this new thing that was called the way, back here in the, in the book of Acts, it was the way, this new way of living. It was, it was a revolution 2,000 years ago, a new way to live. So we lead them to the Lord. And I want to show you, I want to elaborate on that a little bit. Go, do, do a favor, uh, when we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18 through 21. Specifically, this is what the Bible says of us. He's talking about this new life that you've been given. And if you've received Christ as Lord and Savior, and His Holy Spirit lives within you, what does it say? All of this, verse 18, is a gift from God. And so out of thanksgiving, out of gratitude, and all this is a gift from God who brought us back to Himself through Christ, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors, making his, uh, so God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ. When we plead, who's, who's pleading? Who in the house is pleading with people? With tears in your eyes, pleading with them. Come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin. So that we can be made right with God through Christ. So what you see here is exactly what I've been talking about. First, God the Father sends God the Son here. And when he comes here, what does he do? It says, for God was in Christ. He was reconciling the world to himself. He came to seek and save, right? That's what it says. And that's exactly what he did. But then what happens? He dies. He goes to the grave. He ascends to heaven. And while he's in heaven, guess what? We are the body of Christ. We're little Jesus is running around here. And we're supposed to be doing the same thing he's doing. So he uses us. He's given us this amazing message. Not that we can save him. Only Jesus can save him. But it said that Christ came and he was reconciling the world back to himself. And then he gave us this wonderful message. We're just the messengers, but we're to plead with people. Please turn to God. Please turn. It's that important. Do you feel his heart just pouring out when he says that? He's not just saying, hey man, you should get saved. Because it's cool we got like a clue baby. No, this guy, Paul, he like, he knows that if, if he doesn't somehow, some way get to this person, they're gonna go to hell forever. And he's so he pleads with them, like he's pouring out himself. 
for this thing because he knows how important it is. And he's asked us to reconcile people back, that we're the ones making the plea. We are God's ambassadors. Also check out Romans chapter 10, verse 14. We plead, come back to God. <coughs> but here's the thing, here's the, here, here's the where, where, where God really turns the screws on you. <coughs> he says, well, how can they call on him to save unless they believe in him? And, 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 and how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And, and how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? How beautiful are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. And so some of us are sitting around here probably going, well, yeah, if they're sent, if they're like apostles and they lay their hands on them and send them out, listen, just as the Father sent me, so I send you. You've been sent. We're not waiting for another opportunity. You're sent now. You're sent now to go plead with people to come back to God. It is our job now to do that, not later. And we have to, we have to embrace this this. this this heart that Paul has, I want you to get this. He's pleading with these people, please, please turn from your sin and embrace God. Please embrace Christ. Because if you don't, you're going to go to hell. Like, please, he poured, you read this, the, the, the book of Acts, and you know Paul, the apostle. He was so in on this thing. He gave his life for this. Whipped and beaten and jailed and starved, stoned. Dead for the gospel. He tells us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, you don't have to go there. He says, he, he says I, I do everything I can that they might get saved. That's our New Living Translation. I do everything that I can. Like, everything. Whatever it takes. In, in, in the NIV it says, I become all things to all people. I'll do whatever it takes to get the gospel into that heart. Everything. All in. All in. So we save them, and then we dunk them. Not much theology there. He said, go baptize them. Introduce them to God, put them in the family. Here's your coming out party. This is for the world to see that you've made a decision to now be a disciple. And now you've made a decision to be a disciple, and now it's our job to disciple, remember he says, go make disciples of all people, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then what? Teach them all that I have taught you. Very, very simple, Mark 6, 34, Jesus began teaching them many things. So he's, he's speaking, and, we, and you can read the Gospels, you see he just read, he's just rambling off lesson after lesson after lesson to these 12 guys. This is what he's doing. He's just pouring into them all that he knows. Well, maybe not all that he knows. He helped them. He kept a couple of aces in his sleep. <laughs> but he pours into them verbally. Now look also at Philippians 3.17. Paul's like, hey, pattern your life after mine. So not only is there a verbal exchange of information, but you live that life before other men and women so they can see the life of Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Remember the story I shared with you with the youth pastor that was going to overseas and all these kids run up and they just love him and love him and the guy's watching. He's like, now I know what it's like to walk with Jesus. Because this guy was so full of love. He was so generous and kind to all these people. It was like being with Jesus. And that's how we're supposed to be. We save him, we dump him, we teach him. Listen, we have to, if we're on a mission that we are looking for all three of these opportunities Every single day, every single moment, you do not wait to bring someone to the preacher to dunk them. You find the lake, you fill your bathtub with water, you share the gospel with them, and you dunk them. Do not wait for me. Do not wait for me. Do not wait for Kyle. Do not wait for Dan. Do not wait for us. You have, who has a bathtub? Amen. Let's start baptizing people, right? You post it on Facebook. I'm tired of it. You guys do it. Look at the bathtubs we have. Who's got a pool? Mass baptisms. Eric's got a pool. We can do it like crazy over there. <coughs> Jesus. When Jesus 
enters into a heart. When it's real, he even radically transforms a person. And, and, we, and look, this, I love Paul. Paul, all of his writings, everything he did just shows. It gives us the high watermark. It gives us the goal. That's, we, we think that Paul's radical, don't we? Yes. He's not. He should be the rule, not the exception. We should all be like him. That's the call. Now, I don't, I, listen, listen, I don't have some, you know, grandiose thing where everyone's going to walk out and just sell all their stuff and go <laughs> evangelize the world. I hope some of you will. Amen. But I'm just saying, I don't think that, mm -hmm. but that's honestly, that, that's, it's not in here because it's a good story. It's in here because he wants us to be like this. This is, this should be, this should not be the exception. This should be the rule. The exception should be the one who just kind of half hearts it. Like me. Half hearts it like me. And, and the rest of us should be going, man, what's wrong with that guy? He's only in like 85%. What's his problem? <laughs> that, that's the way it should be, right? I mean, listen, listen, listen. The guy rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. I'm in on that. Like, who else can pull this off? Who else can pull this off? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not share the good news. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it, he's with, it, Paul's the total opposite of most people. Most of us are like scared to death to share the news. Paul's like, he feels the weight of this thing. He's like, listen, he's given me this, this treasure of good news. Like, woe to me. Like, he can feel like I'm going to get in trouble if I don't do this. Like, things are not going to work out well for me if I don't share the good news. You know, if I don't share the good news, do you know what happens? I turn into the Dead Sea. I got no flow. And so he can't keep pouring into me if I just don't get rid of this good news. He's like, woe to me if I do not preach. I have to tell people about this Jesus. I am compelled to do so. You know what he means by compelled? It means I can't even explain it. I just know I have to tell everybody. And that's what he's calling us to. Acts chapter 4, verse 20. Same, similar heart on display. Peter and John, the church first starts. They're telling people about Jesus. They're, 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 they're preaching boldly about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's freaking everybody out that's in authority. And they're like, you need to stop this. You need to stop this. It wasn't just their own fears. It was the authorities that could kill them. Right? If you, you can be scared to, to go tell someone about Jesus, they're not going to kill you, most likely. If these people were like, we're going to kill you. If you just see what we did to your boy, you want that? And, and what's their answer? As for us, we cannot help but to speak of what we've seen and heard. Like, they couldn't, they couldn't speak. They couldn't stop it. Like it was coming out no matter what they did. We have to tell them what we've seen and heard. We have to tell them. And Peter just saw his, his boy killed. And he was kind of a chicken. But when you see in the, in the book of Acts, what happens? He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He see what happened. He knows he can, get, he can be killed just the same way. And he boldly comes out and says, you kill him. Embrace him or you're going to hell. You've got to embrace this Jesus guy. There's no other name in heaven and earth in which to be saved except Jesus Christ, whom you crucified. Bold, man. Bold. He couldn't help but tell people about it. He couldn't help. The same thing in Acts chapter 2 and 4, where the church got together, and they were so excited. They couldn't believe what had happened. And because they had seen what had happened, they were like, you know what? We don't have a choice. We have to live this way. Like, it's not even a, a question as to whether we're going to go to church today. They met all the week. You guys all said it last week. Remember that? You said all. Can you say all for me? All. I don't think all of you said it. All. I like it. All the believers met every day. All the believers met every day. All the believers sold their stuff. I noticed something this week, too. This is trust. <laughs> you know what they, all, in Acts chapter 4 it says, all the believers 
They all believed that none of their stuff was their own. So they sold it. And they didn't even care where the money went. They gave it to the apostles, and they handed it out. They just said, I'm selling all my stuff. Here, Cheryl, here's all my money. Do what you want with it. I'm in. And walked away. They gave it to the apostles. Thank you. And then, and then they handed it out. That's how little they cared about the things of this world. They just gave it away. It was amazing. They knew they had to live this way. This was the mission of Jesus Christ. And this mission lived on strong here in the book of Acts. 2,000 years ago, this revolution begins. A totally new way to live. To declare Jesus as King and God over all things. And we are called to the same mission now in 2014. Last week we talked about something that, that can be a little bit confusing. We talked about the mission individually. We talked about the mission of the church. Last week we talked about that the church is a, is, should be focused inwardly because Christians fight about this. We should be focused inwardly but with an outward motivation. Do you remember that? I said that. that if, if we focus inwardly, we, 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 we really embrace this Hebrews chapter 10 thing that says, don't forget meeting together. Don't forget encouraging one another. Don't forget to get together and encourage each other and motivate each other to love and good deeds. And when we share each other's words and we love each other and we pray for each other and we give each other stuff and we babysit for each other's kids and we fix each other's cars and we do each other's lawns. Thank you, guys. When you do this, the light and the love, it's so strong and it bursts through the cracks of the woods and the world see it and they want to be a part of something like that so bad. They're dying for it, literally dying for it. And we have it and we need to share with them. So we're inwardly focused with an outward motivation, right? It's the same individually here with mission. See, the, the, the Great Commission says go. We need to go and plead with people to please turn from your sin and come to Christ. And we need to do that. And that's 50%. See, we're going to truly be on mission with the Lord Jesus, called into partnership with Him. And then as a church family, like, we need to just be, remember I said what, in, in, in Ephesians, I think it was chapter 4, it says when, when we do, when, when God puts us all together perfectly, we all exercise our individual task and our own job, that God makes your church healthy because it's growing and full of love. So if, as we come together, Hebrews 10, and we are filled with more and more love for each other, that we, we get it from God and we give it out to each other, it causes growth outward. It causes growth outwardly. Okay? So, what I'm saying here is that Paul's crazy, ravenous go outward was because God was doing something continual in him. It was a result of this, of, that was the greatest mission field in Paul's life was, was not Rome. It, it, it wasn't Galatia, it wasn't Ephesus, you know where it was? In him. That's where God was working. That's the mission field. If you want to be on mission, everything we do is a result of everything God's doing in us. That's where it starts. And to separate one from the other is wrong. You can't say that we should be an outward-focused church and then say, well, we should be an inward-focused church so that they're both different. We know they are one. And the same thing here, mission, to be on mission, it can't just be to go, the Great Commission, go make disciples, go teach them. That's half of it. Okay, it's in here. And we see this, Paul says, that everything he does is as a result of that. Do me a favor, go to Philippians chapter 4. Things are starting to break in here, so it feels bad. It feels bad. Just need to scream a little bit. No, she tries. Philippians chapter 3. Look here at 14 and 15. Look what it says. Um, I'm sorry, no, no, no. Um, not 14 and 15. Let's just let's start right in 12. Let's get a little context. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things. And we'll talk about it. it it'll go on to tell us what these things are. Well, that I've already reached perfection. Okay, so there we have it. Okay, so Paul, he's just 
with this writer of half the New Testament. And he's saying, listen, I haven't even got there yet. I haven't reached perfection. I'm still sinning. I'm still falling short of the standard that God gives us. Don't look at me as your perfect standard. Look at Christ. I haven't really got there yet. I haven't got there. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. And look, this is just conjecture. This is just me. Okay, it's not the say of the Lord. This is just me saying it. Uh, many people will say, well, when, when you got saved, when he grabbed a hold of you right then and there, that's what he's talking about. My opinion, this is my opinion. I don't think that's what it means. I think it's when you were created. See, when he created us, we were created to be in perfect relation. We screwed it out. Right out of Gideon. But when he put his intention for us, like when he created man and woman, what did he do? He stepped back and said, this is good. It's really good. And it was good. It was, everything was good. Relationship with each other was good. Relationship with nature was good. Relationship with God was good. And then, <clears throat> broke. So when he first made us, it was to be perfect. But we, of course, messed it up. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. But I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. So you see, what, what, here's the great apostle Paul, known uh, above all things to be this incredible missionary, just going across the known world at the time, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ to the world, right? So when he, if he was going to write his mission statement, if he was going to say the one thing that was most important to him, wouldn't you think it would be to go plant churches and, and appoint elders and preach the gospel in every different city in the known world? What does he say? I don't know. I focus on this one thing. He's, he's focusing on what's going on here. See, we can go out there, we can work, 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 work for Jesus all the time, but if you don't let him feed you, you will die. My good friend, Brett Goodhart, who led me to Christ, shared this good news with me when I first said, you know what, Brent, I think I'm called. He said, just remember something, that ministry is designed to kill you. And he's right. He's right. Right? Oh, yeah. He said, I won't kill you. I'll tell you all about it. It's designed to kill you. If you don't turn your phone off and sit at the foot of Jesus, you will die. You can serve him. You can go to Africa, India, Australia, Great Britain, New York City, Detroit, wherever, right up the store. If you keep working and working and working and you don't let him continue to do the good work he began in you, you will die. That's the mission field. That is the mission field. Paul preached, planted churches, appointed elders, rebuked other church leaders for living in error. He discipled one-on-one. -on -one. We know that he at least discipled Timothy. We see that in the scriptures. He healed people. It said that this guy had such an anointing on him that when he, that if there was a handkerchief or an apron that he had worn, if it just, that if the handkerchief, if his booger rag touched someone, they were healed. This guy's crazy holy, right? Crazy holy. This is the man that was called the Apostle. He was so filled with the Holy Spirit, but he knew that that Spirit needed to continue to do the good work in him so he had the power to go out there. Christianity has been melted down to behavior modification. Christianity has been melted down to keeping the set of loose. Christianity has been melted down to a tweaking of who you already are. Christianity is not Moses with his thumb up when he drinks tea. It's a radical transformation of who you are. It changes your every bit of your being. It is totally intended that you would become like Jesus Christ, not a better Charles, not a better, more improved Tim. It's to be like Jesus to be perfect like Jesus. That's the call. That's the mission field that we live on. Last week we talked about the fact that churches fight over whether they should be outwardly focused 
or inwardly focused. And I just want to tell you something. I don't think that that is a question that should be answered. I don't think that that's a question that should be answered. I don't think that anyone wins if someone wins that fight. I think that's a tension that we should learn to manage and navigate because they're the same. They're one. The, a, a real church of Jesus Christ lives in that tension between the two. They, they, they don't go to one extreme or another and say, well, we're just a evangelistic church. No. And we're just a church with disciples, the ones that are just here. Like, that's what we do. No. It's both. That's the tension that we should be living in all the time. It should keep us in this path right here between the two things. Okay? And it's the same thing individually when it comes to mission in your life. It is not just to go and tell people the good news of Jesus and seek and save, but it is also so that he can continue to build in you and change who you are so you can become more like Jesus Christ. Why? So you can be more effective to go and make disciples of all people. They have to both exist. We have to be totally committed to this inner change. We must be completely sold out to this outer change, this, this outer motivation to go seek and save the lost. We become all things to all people that they might get saved. We do everything possible that they might get saved. Anything short of sin, you bring them to the cross of Jesus Christ. If you've got scales and, you're, and you know that you don't save them, they're going to go to hell. Then all these other things just don't matter. And that's why in the book of Acts they realize this stuff doesn't matter because if we don't go all in, people go to hell for an eternity. Millions of years of torture and torment. So I'll give up my car. I'll give up a night to babysit for a non-believer who's going to go drink his face off to show the love of Jesus to somebody. Because the, the scales say inconvenience, sacrifice, eh, that would stink. Hell forever. Anything short of sin, you've got to bring them to the cross. You live to seek and save. That's what we're supposed to do. Okay? Now listen, this is the most crazy. The most, most, okay, you pack all that stuff away for a second, okay? Now here, here we got this, this is, I started thinking about this this week. Okay, we're on mission with Jesus to seek and save the lost across Eustace, the Golden Triangle, Florida, and to the ends of the earth. That's what he's called us to do, right? Now, this is crazy. He, he, he said thousands of years ago that I'm going to build my church, and it's going to work, okay? So, and, and the proof is it did. You're sitting here, right? It's working. It's gone to the ends of the earth. You're here, right? This was not Jerusalem. Is this Jerusalem? So it's working, right? But here's the thing, and it just kind of blew me away. Like, I'm going to say something. Don't stone me. Let me just finish, okay? All other things in this world, you can feel the rocks. All, you just watch the Olympics, right? People watch the Olympics by the millions. By the mi There was probably, you know when they go to a Tennessee and, and for the Olympics, they don't just go to like one arena. Right? You know this, right? I went to Atlanta, where they had it in like 96 or something. The, the, the venues are all across the city. It's not just right there. It's all over, right? So, like, this, I don't, I don't have TV. Where, where were the Olympics? So, Russia. Russia. Where? Russia. 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 Whatever. Okay? So, there was venues all over that area, right? There were probably hundreds of thousands of people that went. Saw it live. Millions on TV. Saw it live. The Super Bowl. 80,000 people go to this game. Another 80,000 in the bars right around the stadium. Millions of people watching it at home. You saw it with your own eyes. The president gets on the State of the Union address, representing the most powerful nation in the world, the strongest government in the world. And you see him with your own eyes. You can hear him. Everything else we see in this world whips Jesus in this. You've never even seen this guy. You've never seen this man. You've never had a conversation with him like this right here. You, you've talked to him. I know we have. 
You know what I'm saying. He's never been right in the living room talking to the guy. You've never seen him. You've never stuck your hand in his side. You've never put your finger through the holes in his hand. None of us for 1,900, almost 2,000, maybe more than that years, no one's seen the dude except that time he resurrected and showed up and said that 500 people saw him. Everyone's like, yeah, man. Good eyewitness, man. 500 people saw him. That's a lot of people. Really? That's how many people go to family Bible. That's not a lot. There's 7 billion people living on this earth now. A little congregation saw him. No one's seen him in 2,000 years. A virgin gets pregnant and everyone's going, yeah, she cheated on him. Let's face it. We believe that she didn't. We believe what the Bible says, but you know what most people were thinking. Come on, right? We believe that, that she cheated on her husband and, and she, uh, uh, Joseph and, and she got pregnant. He was born in a barn. He was a carpenter. It says that he was nothing to look at. His ministry was only three years. Three. We just celebrate Billy Graham. He's like 90-something years old. Jesus Christ's ministry was three years. Him and all of his direct followers were arrested and killed, jailed, beaten. All of them killed, beaten. In some countries, even to this day, the Bible and Jesus and Christianity is illegal. You talk about Jesus, you go to jail. You mention his name, they put a bullet in your head. This is what the world is doing. It's fighting against Jesus Christ. And again, only 500 people saw this man alive compared to the billions that lived. The ones who killed him, shortly thereafter, they adopted the way as their official religion. This is crazy what's going on here. Absolutely crazy. No one's seen him in 2,000 years. And yet, to this point right now, a third of the world's population call him King, Savior, Messiah, and God. This is crazy that this is happening. Do you understand how crazy this is? Do you know how crazy you all are? You've never seen him. You've never touched him, yet you worship him as God. Maybe, just maybe, he's building his church through you. Maybe, just maybe, this Jesus is not just a city that's dead like Mecca, and we look and pray. Maybe he rose from the dead, and maybe he lives right now. Maybe Amen. that's why this is all happening. Maybe that's why two billion people worship him as God. And I'm asking you, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you, once and for all, make Jesus Christ the center of your life, and live for him. Please live for him. Amen. Please live for him, church. The world is dying. People will die and die forever unless they are told. And he has sent you, Revolution Church. He has sent you to seek and save that which is lost. We do this by embracing the things that we talked about. We don't throw money at the problem. We don't just say, okay, we're going on a mission trip. No, we start embracing the things that we talk about around here. We open up our Bibles. We learn about putting other people above ourselves. That's the weapon of the revolution. It's not picking up the sword. It's not picking up the gun. It's not picking up your fist and punching people. They did that. It's called the Crusades. Utter bust. The weapon of the, of the revolution is humility. Considering other people as better than yourself. The weapon of the revolution is to, is to, to be a steward of sex. Stop sleeping around. Stop throwing it around with everybody you see. Value marriage. Use it to glorify Him. Raise godly kids to worship Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. Be a good steward of your money. Don't let it lord over you. Lord over it. Don't use people and all the resources to gather more money for yourself. Take all your money and use it to gather more people for your king. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to, we're supposed to pray more. See, I'm not a good prayer. I'm not a good prayer, but I'll tell you something right now. God, I, I, I don't even know if I shared this with you the other day, but I, I feel like I'm most alive when I'm doing this. 
And that was the only time I ever really felt alive. When I come down, when I leave this place on Saturday night, you guys don't know, I go home and I get depressed. Because I feel alive. Because I know that this is what God made me to do. To stand up and proclaim without shame the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when I'm fulfilling my life's purpose, the reason why I exist, I feel alive, right? So, uh, so when I'm not doing it, I got really, really down. Because then I was existing. I wasn't living. But God's opened up a new door. He's opened up a new place for Moses. And it's a place of prayer. I've never experienced this before. But now when I pray, I feel, I feel alive again. I feel like I'm on, the, I'm on the vine. And I'm not hanging on for dear life. I feel really, really I mean, clenched on there. I feel like his arms are around me. There's an intimacy that I have now when I'm praying. And I see now that things sort of happen when I'm praying about stuff. Okay? When we pray about stuff, things happen, don't they? You know, the other day I'm going to share with you, the elders of the church, we got together, we, made a, we had a vote, and we decided that Cheryl was not allowed to be frustrated, scared, or worried about things about God anymore. She's not allowed to do that ever again. Okay, that's a new one we're going to put in the bylaws, that she can't doubt God ever again, she can't wonder if he's going to come through. Amen. Okay, you guys see the man, she didn't have a car, so God didn't bring her a little car, he brought her home.
of all that God wants to do in and through you. Okay? That's a big song. That's a smartphone, huh? Okay? These things, humility and, and stewarding sex and marriage and love and money and prayer and repentance and all these different things that are the weapons of the revolution, these are just scraping the surface. And this was like a top 10 list. The top 10 list never stops. It's a top million list. Every week that we come together, every week during our 17 gathering opportunities, every week in this church, they are there to teach yet another weapon of the revolution. And if we will embrace it, it's about to let, the, let your roots grow down deep into Jesus. Let your roots grow down deep into Jesus. That's the mission field here. And if you let those roots grow down deep into Jesus, you will be compelled to preach the good news. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm done. Let's pray. And I'm going to have the guys come. We're going to take communion together. Please. Anyone? Okay. Um, Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity to share the Bible. Um, I, I feel alive when I'm doing what you've called me to do. And I, and I commend the same thing to all of us here, Lord, that, that when we step in and do that which you call us to do, we will feel life, abundant life, like we've never felt it before. This is when we feel alive, when we live for you. I remind you of my favorite verse of Scripture, that everything was made by you and for you. Lord Jesus, we have been made for you to accomplish your purpose is called into partnership with the Son, Jesus Christ, and you've chosen us as your ambassadors to bring a message of hope to, to a lost and broken world. Lord, I thank you for this, for this new excitement in our church. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would stir inside the guts of every single person here, Lord. You would inspire us to do greater things, to have a grander vision for this church to not be small-minded, to not think small town, to know that you've called us to preach the good news and to be your witnesses from here to the state of Florida to the ends of the earth. We believe that you've called us to this, Lord, and we want to do everything that we can with you so that that goal is accomplished in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys. Amen. Thank you so much.